Welcome to Stuff They Didn't Teach Me in Sunday School. Just a few months ago, I was in Israel and I wanted to go to places I had never been before. I'd been in Israel before. And the guide took me to a series of caves, uh, sort of southwest of Jerusalem. The caves at one time housed uh, pigeons, thousands, of, hundreds of thousands of pigeons. Those pigeons were used in Canaanite cult ritual sacrifice. One of the rooms was obviously used in fertility cult worship in that particular cave. As fascinated as I was with that cave and walking through, climbing up and down all over that cave, I also felt like I was in the presence of evil, that it wasn't a godly place. It had not been used for godly purposes in ancient times, and that still was reflected in the, in the facility itself. There is evil in the world. Jesus encounters evil in Mark. We, we said that Mark, in many ways, is a holy war narrative. Jesus is constantly confronted by Satan and his minions. And in chapter 5 of Mark's gospel, they, the first line says, They came to the other side of the sea, Sea of Galilee, to the country of the Gerasenes. He's in Gentile territory. As soon as he gets there, he encounters a guy. But the guy is wild and crazy. Naked, bizarre behavior, screaming. He is, he is possessed by a demon. We're told that, verse 5, night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and bruising himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. Now, worshipped not like, oh, my Savior's finally here, but worshipped Satan is in the presence of God, whom he knows is much more powerful. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of God, Most High? I find it fascinating that in Mark's gospel, the people never realize who he is. They don't get it. The demons know him every single time. And now this demon crying out through this deranged man running through the wilderness here recognizes Jesus, Son of the Most High God. Jesus tells the demons to come out of the man. He gets their name. Their name is Legion, for there's a bunch of them. And the demons say, well, then throw us into those pigs. There's a herd of pigs over there. You know you're in Gentile territory when there's a herd of swine over there because the Jews would not have been raising pigs. And the demons are cast into the pigs. The pigs run off the cliff into the, into the sea and are dead. Those pigs belong to somebody. I have a hunch Jesus is going to be just pretty inconvenient in this area because he's now ruined somebody's income while saving this man's life. The locals won't see it that way. They, will see, they won't see the fact that he saved this man's life, even though this man will tell them all about it. They will see that he's inconvenient, and at the end of this story, they ask him to leave the territory. He caused the destruction of one man's livelihood, and therefore they want him out of there. He crosses the boat, goes to the other side. While he's, when he gets to the other side, um, there's a man by the name of Jairus, who's a ruler in the synagogue, a Jew, who says, my daughter's sick. Would you come and, uh, come and care for her? And Jesus says, I will. But before he gets there, he's in a crowd. And in this same crowd is a woman, we're told, with a flow of blood. Probably what that means is she had a constant menstrual flow. And the line is interesting. She had suffered for many years under many physicians. You would like to think she was cured or helped under many physicians, but in this case, she suffered under many physicians. She'd spent all she had and was no better but grew worse. She'd heard the reports about Jesus, came up behind him in the crowd, and touched his garment. Now, Leviticus 15 will tell you that for a Jewish male, to touch a woman or allowed himself to be touched by a woman during her menstrual cycle, during her menstrual period, is to make him unclean. 
That's not Jesus' concern here. You don't find Jesus concerned about his, his ritual cleanliness. You find him concerned about this woman. He, he realizes power has gone out of him. His disciples say, how can you tell that? There are people all around. What do you mean who touched you? And Jesus uh, faces the woman and he heals her. He says, daughter, in verse 34, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. But notice that his compassion for this woman trumped the law of the Old Testament that said that he would become unclean if he allowed her to touch him. Follow through on that. He comes to Jairus' house. J the, the incident with Jairus is kind of the parentheses around this, around this story about the woman with the issue of blood. He comes to Jairus' house, and by the time he gets there, the child is dead. He's late. And they tell him, it's too late, she's dead. And Jesus says, she's not dead, but she's sleeping. He put them all outside. He goes to where the child was, and then an interesting line. Taking her by the hand, taking a dead body by the hand would also render him unclean. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means little girl, get up. Well, you know the story, and you know who you're dealing with. The little girl gets up. But again, compassion for those in need overruled the slavish obedience to the Old Testament law that would demand that he not touch that dead body or that he become unclean when he does. Jesus came to give himself for a world of sinners. He came to lay down his life for a demoniac. He came to lay down his life for a bleeding woman. He came to lay down his life for a little girl. And he came to lay down his life for you and me. And that singular focus of here, his, trumps everything else. It drives him to a cross and an empty tomb.